Madeline Gregg is a sex educator and intimacy coach, and she helps individuals create happy, healthy, and fulfilling sex lives. Now, you've probably seen her on TikTok where she posts daily videos to her 1 million followers where she talks about all things sexuality. One of the areas that she talks openly about is polyamory and ethical non-monogamy. Now, this area of sexuality is not oftentimes talked about or even explored due to a variety of societal factors. So when I suggest to parents to explain to their kids what the different types of relationships there are, including non-monogamous ones, they are often perplexed. Madeline speaks openly about her polyamorous relationship on her socials, and she's also a mom to three young kids. So I was thrilled when she agreed to be on this podcast and talk about how to talk about polyamory and ethical non-monogamy with young kids. I ask her if all non-monogamous relationships are all about sex. How does someone know if they're open to being in a non-monogamous relationship? How did she and her wife explain to their kids that they are practicing polyamory? And she also goes into educator mode to teach us about some of the different types of non-monogamous relationships that exist. If you're curious about non-monogamy in general and how to go about explaining it to kids, you're going to learn a lot in the next 20 minutes. So please meet my wonderful friend, Madeline Gregg. Madeline, it's so great to finally get to talk to you. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. There is, you provide so much education on TikTok. That's where I follow you. I also follow you on Instagram as well, but you do so much education and so much information um, that getting to ask you some really specific questions about non-monogamy, what this one is going to be about. I, I'm thrilled. I just can't wait to s- jump into it because yeah. I've got, I've got a handful of parents Majority of parents, when I tell them, okay, when we start having conversations about the different types of relationships, these are what you're going to have to explain. And then I hit on the non-monogamy part and they're like, what, what what do you mean? And I'm like, well, there is a whole section of ethical non-monogamy. And they're like, and you want me to explain that to my kids? And I'm like, yes. And there's a way we can do it. And then I have a section of parents that are like, I am in a non-monogamous relationship. When do I explain this to my kids? How do I explain this to my kids? Um, and, and that's a whole different section. So I think, I think it's going to be great to have your perspective and to share your knowledge and wealth of information here. And I think um, both, both sets of parents are going to get a lot of information from you. Absolutely. I'm excited. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump into it. Let, let's start very basically. Explain what non-monogamy versus ethical non-monogamy is so non-monogamy is definitely like a blanket term this includes like swingers people who are polyamorous all those different types of polyamory it's like a blanket term it's like saying you're gay it's a blanket term for a lot of things um and then ethical non-monogamy is when you're taking into account people's feelings you're doing it ethically you're being very honest with everything and that looks different for everybody um for example there's like kitchen table polyamory which is when everyone could sit at a kitchen table or all have dinner together and nothing is out of the ordinary. All the metamores and girlfriends and boyfriends and partners to get can get together. Everybody in what we say a polycule. Um, and then there's like non kitchen table polyamory where it's more so separate. Everybody kind of like lives their lives separately and there's not a lot of crossover. Yeah. Okay. So I think you just hit a bunch of terms that a lot of people may not actually (laughs) understand, Um, especially if they are in a monogamous relationship. And this is their first time of of hearing all of these uh, different terms. I think what ends up happening is for a lot of these, these parents, they think, okay, well, it's all sexual. Like all of this non-monogamy is just about sexual encounters. Can you, can you dispel that myth here? It's definitely not all sexual. I mean, for some people, it definitely can be. For example, in the swingers community, it is very sexual um, because it it happens at parties and it is a very like hierarchical meaning. It's I'm going to use very gender terms, but it's a man and a wife together and they go to these parties together. So it's like a monogamous spin on polyamory <laughs> where like you don't really have these um, intense feelings for other people most of the time. Um, but I mean, I, for example, I know a lot of asexual people who are polyamorous because they do want to have multiple romantic relationships, um, and explore, explore relationships outside of like a platonic tone. Yeah. Okay. And so it's it's definitely not all sexual. I mean, it is for some people, 
but overall it doesn't it doesn't have to be and polyamory it looks different for everyone okay so let's like kind of like going into to that differences I think one of the things that really separates the the ethical non-monogamy versus just a general a, a non-monogamous um, relationship is the boundaries and consent, right? Can you definitely the boundaries and consent? Um, and boundary again, boundaries and consent. It looks different for everyone. Some people think that you know the only way to do polyamory correctly correctly is through kitchen table polyamory. So it looks like you're being very honest and open, but that's not how it is all the time. I know a lot of people who are in polycules and polyamorous relationships that they have really no need or want to know their metamors who a metamor is like, um, your wife's girlfriend, Mm -hmm. um, that would be a metamor. Um, yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's different. (laughs) Okay. Yes. I think that's the hardest part I, mm-hmm. for a lot of the parents is saying that sexuality is more than just sex, right? And it's more than just um, sexual attraction, right? We've got romantic attraction, we've got all these different types of attraction that can happen. And I think they understand that. And I think like with sexual orientation, that's been something that parents are now being more comfortable explaining that to their kids. But then you throw in mm-hmm. this all these different terms and all these different types of relationships. And they're like, well, how do I explain that and what's right or what's wrong or, and then, and then I have to go back and step back and be like, well, that's the terminology you're thinking what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. Is the, is, is, is where not uh, non-monogamous individuals are getting away from. Right. Yeah, definitely. It's like, for example, um, your marriage, that's, that's the law, but monogamy in and of itself, that's a choice. It's not, it's not ethically wrong to be monogamous or not monogamous Mm -hmm. or non-monogamous. It's, it's a choice that everyone has. And when everybody throws out their boundaries and their consent and says exactly how they feel comfortable having your relationship, that's when it's ethical. That's really well put. I love how you explain it so nicely so succinctly well it's because i've had a lot of people be like oh i have different morals than you and i'm like hey listen (laughs) (laughs) actually my morals are extremely strong because my partner knows what i'm doing and i know what she's doing yeah that's really wonderful can can we can we talk a little bit about that like how I think for some people, ethical non-monogamy, it's it's not a sexual identity. It's not a gender identity. How does someone even know that they're open to being in a in a non-monogamous relationship? Especially because I think growing up, we're not taught it. Like it's very, very new segment of sex education, especially with with the parents that I'm I'm working with. Yeah. And a little segue with that, it would have been so um, healing for me as a teenager to know that that was even a choice because I didn't even know that non-monogamy could be a choice until I was like well into my 20s. So being able to have tools and words and ways that I could put into a conversation with someone, even as a teenager of like, no, it's not that I want to cheat on you. That's not it. I don't, I don't want to cheat on you. Um, it's the fact that like, I feel like I have a lot of love to give and I have a lot of experiences that I want to have. I want to have these open and honest conversations with you, but I feel like a lot of people are always afraid to have those conversations because they don't have the tools to have them. Mm -hmm. What was your question again? Yeah, no, no, that's really good. I think I think that's the same thing with a lot of people when they, when it talks about sexual orientation and having conversations yeah. about sexual orientation early, it can help a lot of people, a lot of kids who are feeling like, wait a minute, I'm not feeling what I think everyone else is feeling. And then yeah, you give and them I the also, word. I definitely want to add to that though, because like I, I am a queer individual. I am a polyamorous individual and my polyamory is definitely a choice. It's not something that I feel like I was born to do. It's how I like to enjoy my relationships, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to be polyamorous to enjoy my relationships. Whereas me being gay and queer, that is not a choice. I was born this way. It's not something that I can help. Um, But polyamory definitely is something I can help. There's a big, there's a big divide in the polyamorous community where people are just like, oh no, I'm polysexual. I'm polyromantic. I I have to do this. And I'm, I'm a part of, 
the camp, <laughs> that definitely feels like it is a choice. Um, and I think honestly, a little bit of it is because like I, there's a part of me that is not a choice. And I understand that I understand the difference between the two. I think that goes to my question. How does someone know that they're open to this idea of being in a non-monogamous relationship? Like, how does that come about? Maybe personally speaking, or how did you even find out that you were willing to go that route? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that somebody can figure it out. And I definitely think that it's different for a lot of people. Personally, I mean, I... And this definitely isn't normal. I was never jealous of my partners. Um, I was never, I never felt like they were mine to have. And I never felt like they were somebody that um, I needed. I mean, I need to protect them, but not that I necessarily need to keep other people away from. Um, when I would see like my partners, like flirting with somebody at a bar, which like we all do in polyamorous or monogamous relationships, it's just something that happens. Um, I would never be like, jealous. Um, and I think that that's definitely something that made me question how I wanted to be in a relationship. Um, also, I mean, back to when I was a teenager, there was always those times that like, I would be in a relationship and somebody else would come and ask me for if I could go on a date with them. And I would say, no, I'm in a relationship. But I always wondered like, well, what if I what if I did go on the date with them? What if I did explore this other relationship? It doesn't necessarily mean that my relationship with partner A um, is less. It, it just means that I would be able to explore something that's not platonic with somebody who I saw as a friend. Right. I think that's... Um... I think that brings up a really interesting point. And this kind of maybe just diverges a little bit um, for a second here is, you know, there's a lot of talk, um, especially with parents that I, I work with who have a very strong religious beliefs around, mm. um, when it's okay to have sex and when they talk about it with their kids, you know, this is what we believe. Other people may not believe that, but this is what we as a family believe due to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and so I think that, when it comes to this idea of being open in a, in a relationship and being willing to uh, flirt, uh, maybe not even talk about sex, but just the emotional like connection with someone, yeah. they might say that is not being monogamous. What and that's you, really true. What would you say? Yeah. Like how would you Yeah, I mean, that? You know, affairs and cheating, it starts with an emotional tie, even if it is just sex. Um, it does start with emotions. It starts with emotions of like feeling like you want more or feeling like you're not enough or feeling like you want to explore. It all comes from an emotional part, even AMAB people, like it comes from an emotional ties um, before you get in bed with somebody or kiss mm -hmm. someone. Um yeah, it's, I I think in those instances, if I'm talking to a family who is like a little religious or um, who have, who, you know, say like we wait until marriage mm -hmm. choice um, is even after you're married, it, the monogamy, it is a choice. And I really want to hone in on that. It's a choice. It's something that you're going to choose just yeah, just like when you choose when you're going to have sex for most people, mm -hmm. um, it's a choice and you can't, the best advice I could give a family in that situation is like your kid's going to make their own choice. So you need to prepare them for all the choices. Right. Okay. Okay. So well, can you share a little bit about how, because you're a mom of three, right? Three. Two, three. Yes. I Kudos to you. I have two and that's enough for me. I'm exhausted. <laughs> we didn't mean to have three. We had ten. <laughs> uh, got it. Yeah. Um, how do you talk to them about being in a non-monogamous relationship? It's really interesting, you know. Um, I we have a 10-year-old and then six-year-old twins. And um my wife, Bren and I, we started being polyamorous when um, our oldest was two. Mm -hmm. So it's not really something that they remember before. Like, um, 
so it's definitely just like a part of their normal life. And especially with the twins, it's like they've never known a life without their mommies being polyamorous. Mm -hmm. um, but it is interesting because like, like this morning after I picked them up from school, I went on a coffee date okay. this morning. Um, and it was a first date. And um, my oldest said, like, how was your day? What did you do? I was just like, oh, well, I dropped you guys off at school. I worked out. And then I had a coffee date. And it was just like such a normal part of our conversation mm -hmm. um, where they they know I love um, Bren, their other mom. They know that like we sleep in the same bed. They know that like all these normal nu nuclear things that we do, but they also know that I go on dates and I might have relationships with people. Um, but the kids never really meet any of our relationships until we know for a fact that they're going to stick around or if we're friends first with those relationships and then it progresses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so you're, I guess you would say kitchen table polyamory. Well, yes and no. Um, definitely if it's um, going to be somebody who sticks around for a little longer um, or somebody who's a friend first, um, it is very kitchen table um, with the kids in particularly, like they know that like if we go out to eat, sometimes other people are invited and it's we're very, very cautious about who we introduce, especially with my platform. I'm very, very cautious about who is in their life. Um, so, you know, sometimes we have dinner, I was all like a big, big family and that's really beautiful. Um, but if I'm going to have a relationship with somebody and it's really purely sexual, I keep that very far away from my children. Um, and I don't necessarily see a need to introduce them to my family. Like they know I have a family. They might've talked to Bren a couple of times, my wife, but, um, yeah, unless it's like a good emotional bond, we don't really intertwine the the families okay yeah I think I think for a lot of parents and I mean I'm in a monogamous marriage relationship and I think for a lot of it it's it's saying okay well you're you're going to explain this to your kids and and what if they have questions and what if uh they they are they talk about that mom went on dates with their their kids' friends or the parents have questions. And, and I always say like, that's part of explaining that there is consent, there's communication. This is, this is our um, relationship. This is how our family operates. And then there's also other families that operate in these different ways. How do you, how do you talk yeah. about it in a way so that they don't feel like um, they get in, they get in trouble for saying something that they shouldn't have because yeah i think i think that's a kind of a part of um i think a good way to explain that is explain it like um it's like just another family that has like two moms or two dads it's not something that you have to explain to your kids your kids get it right um and your kids probably know that other families don't necessarily <laughs> their parents don't go on dates and sleep in the same bed as other people sometimes right. um even though my kids don't really like think about like the sexual aspect they know right. that like I love multiple people um but they don't necessarily I mean that that is also something that I think a lot of monogamous people don't understand is like my kids have no idea that I sleep with multiple people right. um they see me, they've seen me get home at 7 a.m. and they think that I'm just hanging out with a bunch of my friends. It's right. not necessarily like an orgy, like it actually. <laughs> and that's what I explain. I'm like, when you say you're going on a date with your husband, the kids are like, you're going on a date, right? Like yeah. you're going to a movie and what did you do? You never talk about the sexual part of that date. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I go, so this is kind of the same. I guess I'm trying to get to that point that uh, I think a lot of times, the sex part is so ingrained in this idea of non-monogamous, of polyamorous, mm -hmm. that it's hard for adults in our adult brain to explain it to kids without going into that. It's about uh, kind of like you said, like these different loves, uh, these different people that you yeah. have um, connections with. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely is. I mean, I, I was trying to make that analogy earlier of like, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't really explain to my kids that like, these two men have sex like that yeah. until they're 
older and until they ask me, <laughs> you know, I just say like these two men love each other. And it's the same with polyamory. Like I just love multiple people. You can have multiple best friends. Um, I have multiple partners. Mm -hmm. And so when, when do you think, like, what would your recommendation be for uh, parents who are in a non-monogamous relationship to explain what non-monogamous um what what it is non-monogamy is for to their kids I think it definitely de become yeah yeah it definitely depends when you start to be non-monogamous I mean if you're non-monogamous before you have children th they're gonna catch on like you don't have to sit them down and be like well <laughs> we have multiple real they'll get it <laughs> right. right and they'll ask questions about it or they'll bring it up themselves um but if you are starting a relationship, like when your kids are 10, for example, yeah. our oldest is 10, um, you figure it out for yourself first. Make sure that you feel really secure with your relationship and you feel really secure with how you're doing polyamory before you bring it up to your kids. Mm -hmm. And then once you do, just kind of say it in a casual conversation. I mean, like I'm a sex educator. I have private clients and I always say like, talk about sex outside of the bedroom. Don't talk about it while you're ha having it, right. you know, <laughs> or if you want to bring something up, don't be like, Hey, let's do anal right yeah. before you stick it in. No, right. you want to talk about it beforehand. And it, that's the, that's the same thing with a relationship. You know, you want to make sure that you're okay with your partner with it. And then you can bring it up to the kids and be like, I'm, I'm going to go on a date. Right. This doesn't mean that I don't love your mom or dad or Audie or whatever they call them any less. I'm going to go on a date with somebody and I'm going to see how it goes. And, you know, I'm going to see we're yeah, we're just we're trying something. Do you think I think I think for a lot of individuals who are in monogamous relationships, I think kids quickly pick up on this idea of cheating, like a, a 10 year old quickly understands because of movies and and um hearing things they they hear this idea of cheating very very quickly and and I think in that instant to make sure that they understand that you're not cheating on your partner is to openly talk about it with your partner in front of them mm -hmm. you know I Bren and I talk about dates in front of our kids to each other um like we'll Bren will come home super late I'll be putting the kids to bed by myself they'll ask where the audi is i'll say they're on a date <laughs> and they know they know what that means and they know that like we're very secure so in the morning when we're having coffee we talk about it i'll say like how was your date and then the kids ask too um because they're also i think parents this is like just a parenting thing i think parents are always afraid to as a millennial with boomer parents, we have this like trope of like, we don't really want to give our kids too much than what we can, what they're yeah. ready for, yeah. or what um, they, we don't want them to carry emotional baggage for that. And talking about your own life, especially when it's a happy thing, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not giving your kids emotional, like you're giving your kids emotional baggage. It means that you're able to share interesting things about your life. You know, mm -hmm. my kids ask about rock climbing the same that they would with a date that I went on. It's just a very blase part of my day. Um, and it's important for your kids also to have like an interest in your life. It gives you a little bit of autonomy as like, not just a mommy or not just a daddy or not just a parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, I really love this. I, I think the way I think for a lot of us of being millennials, we hear so much, we're open, we're, we're willing to understand and learn. And so I think hearing it talked this way, this, uh, there is a family, there are kids, the kids are not harmed, right? Like, I think this kind of goes back into this idea of can two moms raise a child? Can two dads raise a child? And we yeah. know that we know that yes, it can be done and it can be done well. Um, that it's about just these boundaries, consent. And I think that kids, and maybe you can explain this a little bit. I think kids in from parents who are in non-monogamous relationships they start learning about relationship qualities in a potential partner. They start learning and talking about qualities much earlier. Can you share about, you know, a lot of times it's when my kids watch Frozen 
and they see, you know, Hans and, and Elsa and or, or Anna. And, you know, I'm like, what do you think, she, what are the qualities do you think she likes about him? You know, like, you know, besides just that um, moment where, you know, it's just like uh, the two people get together and then that's it. But I'm trying to show relationship qualities. And so maybe you talk yeah. about this more because you're going on dates and what you like about this person and what to look for in a potential friend, partner, sexual partner. Yeah, they definitely hear it. And I think they hear it more through like osmosis. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just from like the everyday living of like Bren and I, you know, chuckling over like a glass of wine about hinge, you know? Um, and it, it's something that's just like a, such a normal thing for them to hear of like, oh, mommy thinks that this person is sweet because they did this one particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, just, um, also I was a little hung up because you said Anna and Han it's Anna and Kristoff are together. Oh, it's Kristoff. Yes. <laughs> Who's Hans? Hans is the person who was like, um, oh, the bad one. The kingdom. Yes. Um, oh my God. I have watched that movie so many times and oh my God, this is going to be. It's recorded. like white noise. <laughs> I know. My kids are going to grow up and be like, mom, you, <laughs> they're going to see this later on and be like, you don't know. And be like, I cannot believe this. It's like that million dollar question you get wrong and you were like. Constantly. Yeah, no, I totally understand. <laughs> but I was like, I was a little distracted on that one with the frozen lore. <laughs> totally hilarious. Yes. Okay. Crystal. <laughs> And Anna, <laughs> what do you think Anna likes about Kristoff? You know, like he's got a yeah. job. He has these and I think like, honestly, yeah. even monogamous people can have a little bit of that in their life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's really important for like people to compliment each other. And I think that's exactly. a part of like, I mean, I don't mean to out you, but it's a, it's a part of like straight people culture to like not really talk about what you like about your husband or your wife and like unapologetically like be obsessed with them. Yeah. But my kids know I love the way that their um, other mom wears like lip plumper. I think it's really pretty on them. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that they dye their hair and when they look cute in like different outfits um, or like when they bring me coffee in the morning mm -hmm. um, and they hear me constantly like appreciate it, you know, and it just gives them, I mean, even monogamous people can, can and practice duties. that. Yeah. No, yeah. this has been something that I think is really great. I, when I first talked to you and we were talking about qualities and relationships and how, you know, you know, non-monogamy is so much more than just the sex, right? It's about these yeah. qualities of being with somebody that is interesting, having conversations. And then you bring back those conversations with your partner and, you were like, I had heard this and we talked about this and then, you know, there's another thing. So you get a lot of different aspects. And I think if, if parents take away anything from this podcast and from this interview, it's that you can explain that you've chosen to be monogamous and this is why you've chosen that um, lifestyle and what it is that you love about your partner and care about them and the qualities that you find in them. But you can also explain that there are people who choose differently and that's called ethical non-monogamy. And this is why they may choose that. And there's all these different things and that ultimately it's up to them to decide, right? Um, <laughs> what works for them. And I think that's hopefully where we can start to, I don't know, help our kids to see that it's, it's not just sex. It's about really finding somebody that makes you a better person all around. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely more, I mean, and that's how I would frame it in the beginning, because when your kids just start to date somebody, they're not having sex with them, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're dating in third grade, you know, yeah. and they're dating in middle school. And that's might be when they have their first boyfriend and girlfriend. And it, there's nothing sexual about it. it it's more exactly. about emotion. Yeah. So talking about the emotional side of like connections and relationships, that's, that's your jumping point. And then you can talk about the sex stuff later um, when they're more exactly. interested in that. That is so great. I, I, I really, that's what I really wanted because, you know, ki kissing in kindergarten and first grade, they're like, oh my God, they're kissing. And then I'm like, but this is what we want to talk about. It's not the act of the kiss. It's what do they like about this person? What is it that they yeah. makes them feel in, in that they want to kiss this person and why kiss? Because that's what they see you do when you like 
somebody, right? And yeah. and they want to to have that. And so it's really about finding um, the conversations to talk about it. And I think this was just a great, awesome interview all around. Um, sorry for blambling. Sorry for ruining Frozen. Kristoff is on. Yeah. Are you even a mother? I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right it's it's forever now it's forever here on youtube so <laughs> madeline thank you so much i really appreciate you doing this and um i have linked all of your socials instagram go follow her on tiktok along with me and a million other people who follow her on tiktok so thank Shucks. you so much for being here yeah thank you for having me it was a fun conversation